My name is Nadine Denneth and I'm the youngest daughter of a 63-year-old man who was diagnosed with a mental health condition in his early 20s. My dad had a very good job and worked for the local government and he led a very comfortable and independent life. But this all changed at the end of 2012 when his mother passed away. Her death resulted in him experiencing a psychosis and relapsing and he was taken to hospital under section where he stayed for three months. But by the time he was discharged home, his physical and mental health had deteriorated so badly that he was no longer able to work again and became housebound. Within just three years of that happening, my dad was then under the care of adult social services and he eventually had to move into a nursing home facility, which is where he is today. But what happened to my dad is just an example. There are many more people like my dad, some even younger, who are living in isolation and are practically housebound due to ill health and no longer able to work or contribute to life in their local communities. The solution to this problem is actually very simple and it costs significantly less than the systems we have in place today. So what is this miracle cure to ill health that the NHS even state on their own website? It's exercise. Exercise is medically proven to treat and prevent a whole range of chronic health problems, including depression, stress, obesity, type 2 diabetes, arthritis, the list really does go on. And the cost to the UK as a result of lost productivity and cost to the NHS runs into the billions of pounds each and every year. So I decided to create a social enterprise called Enabled to help educate and empower people with chronic ill health to take back the control of their health and well-being and support them to become integrated and productive members of their local communities. And the way we do this is by providing the person with their own personalised programme of exercise and nutrition as a way to help that person become physically and mentally stronger and more likely to lead a healthier and happier life. Anne is a 55 year old woman who up until two years ago had been working as a teaching assistant, a job she did for more than 10 years and enjoyed. Anne now suffers from depression, anxiety and high blood pressure and can no longer work because she is too anxious to leave the house. Anne is now housebound at just 55 and is taking six different medications for these health problems. Anne's GP decided to refer her to our service but because they had no funding in place to pay us, and as we aren't currently receiving any funding to deliver our service, I decided to help Anne in my own free time, as her health problems did not appear to be improving on these medications. So your doctor referred um, you to us to help you with your physical health yeah. as a way to improve your mental health. So we've been working with you for about 10 weeks now. Yeah. So we, we spend an hour together, don't we? Every yeah. week, one, once right. a week. I bring my equipment with me. We do exercise. You're working with the bike. Do you think that's actually improved in any way? I do. Because we do biking longer, do boxing for longer. If every week I get ahead of myself. And how does that make you feel? It makes me feel better with myself. What would you like to be different in your life? I want to be able to go out and go back to where the way I was. What do you think you need to get you to be back to how you were? Decrease the medication, come off it completely and do more exercise. Because they fit my speech as well, I don't normally talk like this. Mm. I feel as if I can't express yes. myself. Has the doctor or any doctor ever said to you about the physiological changes that happen in the body when you exercise? No. Exercise is medically proven to lower blood pressure. When we started our sessions, your doctor wrote you were 150 over 100, and now... 131. 131 over... 86. 86, so it's actually lowered since we've been working together. Yes. What are you fighting for? Come off the tablets. All they do is sort of cover the surface, but they don't, don't go deep, you know. I think tablets should be used as a last resort. Well, I hope you get what you want, and So do I. Asad is 26 years old and originally from Pakistan, having moved to the UK in 2012 to be close to his family. He has an inherited genetic condition that causes sensory impairment, obesity and learning difficulties. Two years ago, Asad had a support plan drawn up by his local authority and he was told he'd be entitled to a care package worth £10,000 a year. 
This money would pay for his yearly support needs, including personal care, outreach support and domestic support. Two years later, Assad is still without outreach support and domestic support. So his father contacted us in the hope that our service could help Assad. As we cannot help Assad for free, Assad has now been without any additional support for the last four years and unsurprisingly, he has become depressed and socially isolated. To make matters worse, he has also gained an additional 30 kilos in body weight, which now poses a serious health risk for Assad, increasing his chances of getting type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, which are just two conditions linked to physical inactivity. Today we've been invited round for lunch at Assad's family home, and we're going to accompany him to his GP practice to see if they can offer any solution to Assad's current dilemma which is now affecting his health and mental well-being. When you were living in Pakistan, you were more active there? Yes. Did you play any sports? No, I just uh, do some Special Olympics, 50 metre. So you did a 50 metre race? Yeah. His reply was quite firmly, it's not our responsibility, yeah. it, is, uh, the, it was the government, he, and I said, well, the NHS England is part of the government, so who would you suggest we speak to? He said, you just need to speak to the CCG. Can you believe this is what we're having to go through, just to help one young man in his early 20s to have a life? To me, it is unacceptable that this is the route we're having to go down. Lots of bureaucracy, lots of you need to speak to this person, you need to speak to this person, and never getting an answer. After a disappointing meeting with Assad's GP, I've decided to get an opinion from another medical doctor about our current healthcare system. I'll soon be interviewing Dr. Don Brennan, who is a medical doctor who qualified in medicine in 1979, and since that time has worked in different hospital settings and as a GP. That must be him. Why do you think the model is set up around disease and illness as opposed to promotion of health? Because disease and illness were so in your face. People were dying in the 18th, 19th century from infectious diseases, uh, the, the, there, there was very gross uh, suffering and the emphasis inevitably had to be how do you cope with the extremes that, of suffering that people had and so the medical model motivated by the relief of suffering focused on disease and so that was reasonable for its time. However, we are in a much more fortunate position in that we have handled or acute illnesses, pretty much, very well. Trauma, very well. Um, but the sort of illnesses people now suffer are chronic and modern medicine does not heal. It treats, unfortunately, often symptomatics, as symptoms so that if the actual underlying illness progresses and the medicines continue to pile up, but people are not being healed, so a different model is required. I remember just so striking in uh, fourth night, where um, one of the professors, he said, um, prevention is the best cure. Yes, but we'll continue with the diseases. That individual professor had the insight to recognize that this was, you know, important prevention, but also he recognized that medicine is all about treating a disease. It was Schrodinger who said that the advances that happen in science occur over the, 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 the coffins of the previous generation. And basically new paradigms are very slow to come in. The solution that's always talked about is in terms of more money for psychiatry, more money for general practice, more money. More money is not going to solve the problem. The model is broken fix the model, that means a new paradigm, a new approach is gradually getting there. The approach is you empower patients, not doctors. The, the person at the core has to be the 
patient, the finance has to orientate around the patient. And the patient has to be educated, and education is the absolute key. Education of patients, primarily, they can actually take care of their own health. In fact, where education happens, and the patient is given ownership and give, empowered to understanding their situation, they're highly motivated mm -hmm. to change. They do not want to die from a stroke. And so where they given that opportunity to understand that a DASH diet or that um, the, the exercise would make a significant difference, you would find that if you brought them back a month later, they would be taking more exercise and they would, if they had that sort of, sort of support. Mm -hmm. What you offer is a fantastic service. But actually what it would require is the general practice practitioners would be educated to the availability of such a service in their area but not only that they would need to be reminded occasionally and so that if a patient is there for only three five minutes and the doctor is saying well you you need to be taking exercise there's the website there's the phone number but the doctor needs that immediately available to him here in his awareness and in his protocols who's paying it is true that the funding is now coming more into the general practitioners, but then you have uh, groups of general practitioners buying the funds for their particular projects. And so, in, unless in that situation you have someone in a position of influence distributing funds who has a specific interest, unfortunately, you know, the funds won't be made available. But, you know, that is again the old model, people trained in the old model of treating disease are very likely to spend the funds treating disease. Mm. Um, and that's where it requires that there is a whole total um, new emphasis. Mm. Empower patients, educate patients, educate doctors to be evidence-based of, of uh, lifestyle diet um, uh, programs. And, you know, gr gradually we should get there, but it will be um, I think the few uh, individuals who are out in front who will make those changes happen. Thank you very much, Dr. Brennan, for your huge insight well, into the thank, current state of the healthcare system. Thank you, Nadine. You are the pioneer. Oh, you must keep up you. your work. I will. You will succeed because the time is changing. My name is um, Harrison Carter. I'm the current co-chairman of the UK Medical Student Committee in the BMA. I'm also a student at Cambridge doing a, a Master's in Public Health. Uh, I'm involved in a research group at Cambridge looking at nutrition education, but particularly how we can educate medical students and junior doctors. There is a, an issue with medical education in this country. Where medical education falls behind is that it's not preparing doctors to be the type of doctors we need in the NHS today the doctors that care about the whole person, the doctors that consider critically ideas around nutrition, around diet and exercise. The fact is, um, there have been a number of reports about uh, the importance of nutrition, the importance of prescribing exercise and other therapies beyond medicalised kind of drug treatment, but that's not getting through into medical education and medical curricula in the medical schools across this country. One of the problems is it's very difficult to change and modernise medical curricula. In the 1990s, the Department of Health produced the Eat Well report, mm -hmm. which looked at the importance of equipping medical professionals with the knowledge and information to enable them to help patients and improve their nutrition. Then a group called the Intercollegiate Group for Nutrition of the Medical Royal Colleges, so the, the training bodies for junior doctors and senior doctors, that group was formed and, and it produced a curriculum which hasn't been implemented in most medical schools in this country. You know, we have a population that's getting uh, more obese. We still have a high burden of disease associated with smoking tobacco. Uh, we also have a high, very high burden of disease which is actually going up in terms of people drinking alcohol. Um, and we need more, more innovative, uh, inexpensive solutions to, to some of those problems. So doctors need to be open-minded. They also need to realise that in order to be good advocates for their patients, they need to think outside the box. And I think the way we start doing that is by 
making medical schools recognise that they also have an obligation to the future population because you know the people that they're people that graduate from medical school will have an obligation to the population to treat them, but medical schools have an obligation to make sure that that future doctor is catering to the future needs of the population. That's the type of person uh, that medical schools need to be preparing, and that's how we start you know, making change in this area. The only thing that is currently stopping me from being able to help Assad and others like him that would benefit from our service is funding. I've applied to many grant funding organisations but never get through to the second round. The one time that I was able to get through to the second round was when I applied to the NHS Clinical Commissioning Group's Innovation Bursary Fund in my local area. After I had the interview, I was told in my feedback that the idea was a very good one and that it addressed a, a gap in service provision. However, they also told me that the idea was too ambitious. I'm now on my way to interview John Gillespie, who's the Health and Wellbeing Officer at Tower Hamlets Council for Voluntary Service. He was also sitting on the panel of my interview. So I want to interview him about the funding challenges that are currently facing the community and voluntary service sector today. My sense is that commissioners generally commission for things that they're statutorily obliged to do. The challenge is, I think, to get funding for interventions that, like yours, produce benefits, have the potential for saving the system money. Like my sense is that if people are more mobile, able to live um, generally healthier lives, get out and meet people, they're less likely to succumb to other um, mm -hmm. long-term health conditions. Yeah. So there's an argument there for what you're doing, creating savings. However, it's really difficult for commissioners to take funding out of the acute sector, which basically means hospitals, in order to transfer it and front load it into the kind of stuff mm -hmm. that you're doing. Primary care is a statutory responsibility. GPs have to be funded. They're under quite a lot of pressure at the moment in terms of their own funding. And also, to be completely honest, I don't think there's quite a sort of parallel valuing of the work that happens within the voluntary sector and the need to fund that as there is of the work that happens within primary care itself. The voluntary and community sector, so particularly the small end of the voluntary sector, is where a lot of the solutions to the budget challenges that the health system is currently facing lie. It isn't just commissioners. The whole, there's a whole cultural thing, like, you know, in the Brexit campaign, where the figure of, I don't know, was it 360 yeah. million a day extra for the NHS was bandied around as automatically a good thing to have more money in nurses and doctors and that kind of thing. I think as a society we need to be really critically examining those assumptions and looking whether that's actually the best, yeah. the place we need to be putting putting money because it's kind of taken as given that it is. Whereas personally I think that given the challenges that we face as a society there's a lot stronger argument for putting more money into communities and into the things that keep people well. And I think the fact is there's a system at the moment, and most people would acknowledge this, we're tinkering with the, around the edges, mm. but we're not really making inroads into the scale of the challenges. So there has to be some kind of a radical reconfiguration of the way we, we think about health and care and much more onus on communities doing more for themselves. Speaking to Dr Brennan and our future doctor, Harrison Carter, has helped to highlight the fact that Unless our current medical model, which exists entirely to treat the symptoms of disease, alongside our medical curriculum system for our doctors, is changed, things are just going to remain as they are. The solutions to both the NHS and social care crises are out there, as John clearly outlined. Instead, what is happening is, year upon year, more money is being front-loaded into the statutory sector, while the community sector is still seen as a sideline non-priority, when in fact, investing in community services that exist and work hard to prevent people from needing to use the statutory sector is actually what's going to help save the NHS and allow it to be used as it was originally intended for emergencies only. The problem we have in this country, like Harry mentioned, is that our future doctors who are coming through medical school now are still not being equipped with the tools they need to educate their patients 
on how their lifestyle is impacting on their health. What we need is a forward-thinking NHS clinical commissioning group or local authority that is willing to be brave and step up to the plate and create a new health and social care model that is actually going to direct its financial resources into keeping people well as opposed to in hospital and queuing up at the GP surgery. Change happens just one person at a time and Enabled is just one of the solutions to the current healthcare crisis. We exist to try and prevent people like Anne and Assad from their health deteriorating even further and being unable to work again or contribute to life in their local community. If you would like to be part of this solution, then we need your help. We can be of no use to anyone if we don't have any secured funding in place to allow us to deliver our service to those who need it. So we are looking for a commissioner from an NHS CCG or local authority who is open to test drive our service on a small scale. We're also looking to raise £20,000 to commission a study that will allow us to externally validate our findings and maybe even get these results published in an NHS journal. All we're looking for is finally a chance to get to do what it is that we do best, making positive change happen one person at a time.